there are styles of breath. There's like Wim Hof, like hyperventilation. There's like Buteco, like hypoventilation. So like where you're over breathing and then you're doing breath holds. And then when you're, when you're lowering volume um, and, and then there's like, um, and there's like trance inducing breath for more like of your emotional, esoteric, spiritual experiences and that kind of stuff. So there's, there's, there's different levels and different types of breath. And it's like, which one do I, what the fuck do I do? All right, Rising Man fam, got another man joining me here today, live from St. Petersburg, Florida. Ryan Carroll in the building. What's up, man? What's up? What's up? Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah. It's good to connect with you. We just got to know each other a bit for the past 10 minutes and yeah, sure. hearing a lot of connections, man. It's almost like I'm talking to a bro. Like I don't even have to give you any preamble. You just kind of get it. <laughs> it's a magic Instagram, man. That's it. That's it, man. So, um, so yeah, let's, why don't we jump right in? I, I don't waste any time getting right to it. I always ask my guests this question to start off. What does it mean to be a man? Man. So uh, I've, I've heard this a, a, a lot, um, and I've heard some, some beautiful answers, then I always try to think about like, what, what do I think? What do I believe? What, what do I feel being a man is? And it's, it's such a tough question. It's like, um, to be a man and to be, we hear grounded, we hear uh, protector, we hear, um, uh, you know, also being vulnerable. We hear all those terms. And it's like, what is that? Like, to me, what is it? What is, what do I feel from those things? And, to be a man for me is, is all those things, but it's also, uh, being, being part of, of a growing, um, community that kind of enriches each other, um, and with other men to be able to, to support each other. Um, and then also like having that, that integral, that family that, you know, that with your wife, with your, with your partner, your, your spouse or whatever, you know, being able to, support that as well. Um, and, uh, you know, it's all, all those, all those words, you know, the meanings behind those and how you actually truly feel about them, whether or not you're actually living those, uh, that, that part of the journey is also being a man being to trying to live up to what you expect from yourself, not from what other people are expecting f- from you. Yeah. Oh, I love that, man. Um, yeah, the, the, the first few words that you, that you mentioned there, grounded, protector, vulnerable. I think these are things that, so many men would sign up for if they if they saw the pamphlet yeah. for manhood. They're like, yeah, I want to be a grounded man. I want to be a protector. I want to be vulnerable and yeah, that's what's something. a vulnerable one. Like, <laughs> well, but a lot like, of men will be like, oh shit, all right, you know, that's yeah. But more and more it, these days, right? Like, that's, yeah, it is. No, seen, totally. That's something to sign yeah. up for. That's something that's being asked of from yeah. us as men. I just I just got done leading a retreat this weekend, and a big mm-hmm. topic we talked about was what is it like to be a man who has emotions but doesn't get led by them. That's a really yeah. big distinction in a yeah. world, in a society where that's what's being asked of us right now is we want mm-hmm. men to feel things because when they don't, we become time bombs. And mm-hmm. if we feel things too in, too chaotically, then that's also really scary and dangerous. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that? Like the respond versus react kind of situation. Where oh, yeah. We, we, yeah. The more the more vulnerable we become, there's there's that that um, that uh, the saying where where we're being vulnerable in a group where you're safe is the most healing uh, environment for you uh, opposed to the opposite side, which is most men are at where they are being vulnerable in an unsafe space uh, with people they should trust, you know, and they're not, there's not, they're not kidding. So that's where that reaction goes opposed to being able to respond, being able to share and be able to be safe with those feelings. Recognizing the space and the environment. So important yeah. having, having that awareness. And so mm. I'm interested because you're a man who's, facilitating community on the other side of the country in a different part of the world down in Florida. And I'm sure obviously your messages stretches the bounds through more than just Florida, but what is, what does that look like when you talk about a safe environment for men to explore their emotions and vulnerability? What what does that environment, that safe setting look like for you? Um, When you just the simple act, this like the simple act of creating a space uh, is the environment. Like you don't have to do anything else. You could just be like with, with, with other men, you know, s- set up a time, but like, I just want to get together and be in the space, um, to share, to be together. And there's no structure, uh, that immediately creates that, that space where vulnerability is just a flowing, um, beautiful energy with, with each other. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I there's, there's certain things that I always tell men to look out for, you know, is there's that recognition in the body. 
right? There's, there's always that apprehension, that nervousness, even in a really safe place of sharing something that's going to be vulnerable, but being able to look around the room and having that agreement of confidentiality, nothing that is said here is ever going to leave this space. And we can look around the room and see that everyone agrees to that and is willing to honor and uphold it. And also that there's an agreement to not, to no judgment, right? That I'm not going to judge mm -hmm. you for whatever you say or share that literally anything that you have to share can be said and spoken here in the space. Mm -hmm. And you will not be made to feel less than you'll not be made to feel anything other than you were will essentially treat it as neutral. That to me is, it's a rare thing. And I think that a lot of times where we think that there may be safety in a space, there may actually not be. And it's something that is not complicated. It's actually very simple to create a space mm -hmm. like that, but you also mm -hmm. require people who are anchored and grounded in the room. So going back to what you said about being a, being grounded, being a protector, um, so much of what drew me to you and your message was, was what you were saying about breath. So I'm interested in how did you find your way into breath, breath work, the nervous system regulation that I know you're so passionate about? What was your entry point into that? Uh, my entry point with, with breath was growing up and having severe anxiety, panic attacks, and then eventually anger. Uh, lots of, lots of anger when I was, you know, from, from um, a teen till all the way up to my early twenties, where I started to see this stuff and that it was, it did not have longevity for me um, or for any kind of future and wanting to overcome it. Um, and then the first kind of places I went towards with that was, was I got into fitness. I started uh, coaching others and helping them with just general, not, not knowing what I was doing um, because everything we do, regulates the nervous system in one direction or the other. I mean, almost anything we do, whether it's substance, movement, uh, how we sleep, um, our, our community, the people we surround ourselves with, um, the drugs we take, you know, whatever, whatever vices we want, we're, we're, we're pushing ourselves one way or the other. We're, we're either in a, a sympathetic state or a parasympathetic state, you know, it's in, and for me, exercise, diet, that stuff, was really helping me with a lot of, of those. It was an outlet for, for the anger. It was an outlet, help me, help me regulate my nervous system so that I wasn't so anxious and it wasn't intentional. Uh, and then down the road, as you get into the health industry, the world, like you start to find different tools and different things to help, um, help that you kind of niche into what you can, what you can do for others. So in my, in what I was trying to do, I was trying to help others with, with these things. And breath is always just like, I breathe every day. I don't need to learn how to do that shit. It's like, it's like, you know, it's like, it's like blinking. It's like, why would I learn how to like blink better? You know, that's, that's such an um, important thing though. To, to, let's just pause there for a second. Cause I yeah. think that's a really important thing to focus on. I love what you said before, just a minute ago about everything that we do, everything we do, everything we consume, everything we believe influences our nervous system and mm -hmm. that we, we have influence over those things. I, I can decide what I put into my body. I can decide what I eat. I can decide what I read on my social media and all of that's impacting my nervous system. And what you just said about breath, I think is a good representation of the conversation I so often have in my mind. Like, oh, I don't need to do my breath exercises because that just happens anyway. Or mm -hmm. I don't need to worry about what I'm eating this morning. My body's resilient. I'm still in my early thirties. Like I'll be fine. Just the, mm -hmm. the nonchalance we have when dealing with something that's so sensitive and influenced by, by the things that we do, like our nervous system. Yeah. No, I totally. Agree. I mean, it's each, each piece of those, like whether a small, like I'm, I'm, I'm in, everybody's kind of in the same boat. I mean, there's super disciplined people that can like, you know, that do all this perfect, but then that discipline may be their, their vice, you know, yes. that, that they yes. take too far. So we all, we all have it. We all have like, what area are we, are, what area are we fucking up in that, that we really just need to, to prioritize because the small things add up, you know? So w with the breath, the breath is, is the base of the pyramid. You know, we, we typically, we love to start in an inverted pyramid. Like we love, like, look at like exercise again. Um, you know, I'm, I, I train and stuff like, so that's going to be my go-to like, um, uh, analogy, but we love training, like all the big, all the big muscles, the prime movers, but sitting down doing, doing our like intrinsic small musculature that stabilizes the spine and, and start from the, from, we should be building out. Um, same with the breath. The breath is the base. We should be starting at the breath. And um, it never really, I, 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 I would always tell people, you know, all right, just breathe a little bit, you know, just take a couple breaths. And in reality, 
it's a, it's good advice. I mean, take stopping and taking a couple intentional breaths uh, has huge effect. Whether it's um, whether it's three breaths, which has been proven to to alter the nervous system uh, and and bring you back towards a parasympathetic state, or whether it's sitting down for for sixty minutes and and doing a full breath practice, um, it doesn't it doesn't matter whatever you whatever works for you. But like, but but I just never saw that the breath was so impactful until I, you know, I was teaching it too. I was teaching people do this breath work and go do this. And then I'm at home, like, I am not doing that shit. You know, yeah. I was like, just living a lie, you know, not, not living, um, what I was teaching. And yeah. when I finally did the power of, of, of that for me was so life-changing that it's just like, that's been for the past eight years, been my, like, just die, like my, my focal point is I need to teach this. I need to spread this. Oh, well, footnote there, man. I I gauge a lot of my respect for men based on how willing they are to look in the mirror and look at themselves and, and own mm. it. And I love when I hear a man say, you know what? I'm not I'm not owning what I'm saying. Let me go back and and really, yeah. really respect, give respect to my practices and put in my own reps. That's that's one thing. So already, mm-hmm. like, man, I got so much more respect for you than I already did. Wow. And I want to go back to, so here, one of the things I love to do on the podcast here is I love to think from the mindset that I think other guys in our community are going to be thinking from. And mm. I just had an objection come up in my mind, right? Yeah. Like I was like, okay, so what, why, why should I make time? Like I don't have the time to, to, to do these things to take three breaths or to do an hour of breath work every day. So what do you say to people who have that objection come up that, man, I, I don't have the room or space in my life to do that? Well, um, it comes down to how important it is. So I would ask, uh, so is everything good in your life? Is how's, how's your stress level? How's your performance? How's your, how is your sex life? How is, I mean, what, what things do the breath uh, affect? What don't they affect? So, you know, I'm like, if you, if you don't have, if you don't have, if, if you were to take three breaths, you take a four second breath in an eight second breath out, it's 12 seconds. You do that three times. That's 36 seconds. If you don't have 36 seconds to devote to your well-being, then it's fucking give up. <laughs> it's just like what what else? Is, you know, like Boom. you got right you got to have some kind of discipline with some something, and that's not asking a lot to get real change. Like I, well, the first thing I, I prescribe to people, uh, that, I mean, non-performance related, I, I, like like actual just uh, mindset well-being. The first thing I prescribe is is, is those breaths, three breaths as many times a day as you can do it and you can do it driving, you can do it at work. You can do it anywhere. You can do it in the bathroom. You can do whatever you want to do, you know, and it's just three breaths. It's in through the nose, relax the jaw, relax the lips, exhale through the mouth long as you can inhale big to the nose, exhale long as you can through the, through the mouth, do that three times. Significant difference. I mean, if you look at like, we have like, I'm not like a, a polyvagal like expert or anything like that, but we have like vagal nerves that go out like into the lips. So all that, like all those different vices that we have drinking, eating, you know, nail biting, uh, sucking on our thumbs, all that stuff. When we release the jaw, we release the lips, we exhale nice and slow. That's just, that's an additional piece that is, is helping us get into that parasympathetic state. And yeah. So three breaths. I want to emphasize that, right? If if you don't, if you can't, if you can't make a minute, one, 60 seconds of time in your day to pause, do those three breath cycles, like you said, and to do that a few times a day, let's say you do that five times a day. So five minutes spread out throughout your day. If, if that already feels like it's overwhelming, we got bigger problems, mm-hmm. right? Cause I would, I, and without assuming anything, I would say that somebody is deeply entrenched in a story that says, I don't have, that's just a survival story. They're, they're mm-hmm. deeply entrenched in a survival story where time is a over, over prioritized resource and also shaped in a way that I, I can't see where I could fit anything else in. I know people like that. And I'm like, damn, I've been that guy before too. Having two small yeah. children, trying to run a business, trying yeah. to do all these things. I'm like, I don't even have time to breathe for a minute. Mm-hmm. But like you said, it impacts so much of our life and our yeah. experience. And so um, I also think that it's, because this has some, been some of my own objections in the past. I have, I'm a doctor in physical therapy too. So when it comes oh, cool. to physiology and I, I love this stuff, the science yeah. of it is amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's the scientist in my mind. 
always is looking for more proof and evidence that this is actually yeah. a valid thing. That if I if mm -hmm. I really do this, there's going to be measurable and qualitative feedback from my body that oh, I actually feel different. And mm -hmm. everybody in this society is looking for the silver bullet because we all have a, have a very similar story. I don't have enough time, so we want mm -hmm. if we're going to do something, we want to believe that it's going to have an impact and that. If I, if, and when I do it, it's going to have a hundred percent guaranteed return on investment, mm -hmm. <laughs> even if it's just yeah, 60 yeah. seconds of breath, you know? Yeah. 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 It's, 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 uh, so that's, that, that is true. Like, so we're trying to find, we're trying to find proof in something that is something we do every, every day, like something that we like, again, looking at like the physical, it's, it's just kind of like running, like running is something is, is like we, we walk and we, 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 everybody can walk and run everybody, but like, people that can walk and run. It's just a daily thing. It's not something we think about, but when we go, it's the one thing in the gym where we're like, yeah, just go and do it. Don't worry about your form or don't worry. you like, and then you just go pound pavement for 1500 reps in, over 30 minutes and bad reps. We cause problems all the way up the chain. It's the same thing with breath. We, we don't think about how poor our form is on it and how many breaths that we're taking a day and the quality of the breath that we have and what it does to our nervous system. The breath directly affects the nervous system, how you breathe, where you breathe. So if you're stressed, if you're anxious, you have those issues, this is, this is the magic bullet. The breath is the magic bullet. It's, um, it's the, it's the, the, the base I mean, Obviously there's big picture stuff and there's a lot more, a lot more input, but that's the nervous system. The nervous system, is a processing the, the human being is a processing and we get input we process it we have actions and output and what that feeds back into the other side as we go through and create these that that system is based i would say based in the breath or you can hold the breath can can hold that space and create the direction that we take that that output that action right and one of the things i love about breath is it's almost like the unit, we could call it like the universal language, right? It's something that every human, I would even say every organism does the exchange of gases, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's oxygen, carbon dioxide, or the other way around, mm -hmm. every single organism that's living is exchanging gases with its environment. So thinking of it as a universal language and going back to my own background as a physical therapist and just as a trainer, as a personal trainer, I would always have people come in and say, I need help. I'm like, okay, great. How can I help? Well, I, and then fill in the blank, right? I want to lose weight. I want to decrease my pain. I'm like, great. Okay. Well, why do you want to do that? And usually at that point, they're like, well, isn't that enough? Like, I just want to, I want to get fit. I want to have six pack abs. I'm like, okay, well, why do you want six pack abs? Or why do you want to lose five pounds? And really getting clear on what that purpose is for the sake of what, and applying this to breath. Like, what, what do I want mm -hmm. to develop my breath for? Why do I want to work on my breath? Well, I want to regulate my nervous system better. Okay, well, great. Well, why do you want to regulate your nervous system better? And getting as clear as we can on the purpose, because I find that number one, mm -hmm. remembering what the purpose is will actually inspire you to do it more often. <laughs> if it's just, well, I want to lose five pounds. Well, maybe that matters to you today, but maybe that's not as important to you tomorrow. But mm -hmm. what is something that really matters to you? And then also clarifies what type of breath that you're going to work on. Exactly. Um, exactly. Are, you a, are you a mixed martial arts fan? Um, I, I mean, I've, I've dabbled in it, but I've trained a little bit of Muay Thai and stuff okay. like that, but I don't, I don't follow anything or, or watch All right, cool. It, so. Well, yeah. for those who follow MMA, there's this, um, there's this guy in the UFC called Israel Adesanya, Izzy. Um, and he, he goes by the name, the last style, the last style bender. Cause he, he kind of incorporates so many different styles into the way that he practices. And I saw a clip recently after one of his fights and somebody was asking him about his breath because they noticed he was in the, he was in the ring and he was, he kept his lips shut the whole time. He, he didn't breathe through his mouth for an entire championship fight, which Jeez. if you've ever done any kind of martial arts, it's a hard thing to do, That's right? Even, yeah. Yeah. even just going for a run and trying to breathe just purely through your nose. Yeah. Um, and he, he basically just schooled this interviewer because the person had no idea what they were interviewing. They just said, mm -hmm. why do you have your mouth glued shut? And he just schooled them on the importance of breathing through his nose. And he said that it helps him regulate his nervous system from going into that peak survival mm -hmm. state when he's in the ring, which gives him an advantage yeah. over his opponent. And I was like, well, damn, that's a really clear and, and amazing context to have for training the breath. Yep. And his breath work is going to be different than somebody who's not worried about getting their ass kicked in the ring. So yeah. going all the way back to purpose, uh, how important is that when you're prescribing breath work strategies to people that you work with? 
Yeah. So that's, that is, that's huge. That's, that's, so there are styles of breath. There's like Wim Hof, like hyperventilation. There's like Buteco, like hypoventilation. So like where you're over breathing and then you're doing breath holds. And then when you're, when you're lowering volume um, and, and then there's like, um, and there's like trance inducing breath for more like of your emotional, esoteric, spiritual experiences and that kind of stuff. So there's, there's, there's different levels and different types of breath. And it's like, which one do I, what the fuck do I do? You know? Um, so yeah, if you ha- are, if you have anxiety, if you're stressed doing some of the Wim Hof stuff or like some of the hyperventilation, some Wim Hof is not is as intense, but some of the more intense stuff that they do, um, because it's so popular, it's the first thing people go for. It's like Wim Hof, I'm going to do that. And for a lot of people, they get great results from it. It's awesome and whatever, but, uh, the intensity sometimes is too much in, 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 in elicits a, a full on panic attack. Cause it's just so close. When you feel that, when you do that, it's, it, you're going, you're going, you're, you're uh, arousing nervous system and you're going to feel just like a panic attack. So, um, the best route for, for that I usually do. Um, and then this is what I run with people to get in a, get an example of, of how things affect their nervous system is I do a state scan and the state scan is basically, we go through a meditation where we are, we're, um, we're listening to our breath and then we're listening to our heart and then we're listening to our heart and our breath. And then we're listening and paying attention to our feelings, our thoughts, our physical sensations and like just letting that that be there i mean even if you're stressed out you're fucking you know, you're really hating this meditation like that's great just listen to it just be a part of it be be present and be aware of it and then we go into a few different breath um cycles of different styles of breath we do we do a hyperventilation we do a a breath hold we do a uh, controlled breath a hypoventilation and then we come back to that state scan and we see how we got affected by those 30 breaths that we just took. And I've never, I've never had a, a situation where that wasn't hugely impactful, but we can do that state scan per, per cycle. Be like, all right, we just were stressed out. Let's do some hyperventilation see how you feel now. And then they'll be like, not so great. I don't feel great. You know, it's like, this is, I'm a little elevated, you know, but like, all right, so let's just try that again. And we go into um, a more calming breath, box breath or long, like a three, like, a three to one the exhale to inhale. So basically there's a long exhale um, and those kind of things. And then we can see what works for that person and where they need to be and how they need to regulate their state. And then we can create that program for that breath. And it's simplified. So, so let's talk about some of the variables that we could introduce to breath. Cause I know a lot of people out there have had different experiences of breath work. And so if we just look at some of the variables, so in general, would you say that speed, if we're breathing faster, like a hyperventilation where we're doing more breaths than our typical cadence, that's generally going to raise energy, right? So generally speaking, that's going to raise energy and bring us into more of a sympathetic state, would you say? Yeah. So there's, um, if you ever heard of like breathing gears, we mm-hmm. wouldn't call it. Okay. So basically, yeah. Pick up the speed through the nose, you know, is going to elevate the nervous system a little bit. Then we're going nose, mouth. That's the next step. And then mouth, mouth uh speed wise is going to be like you're all out like we're going for it you know that's so there are like like the the levels that we kind of creep into the intensity and there's there's places for it where that's that's you know that's used for that you know we want to get those states that's more like the trans inducing stuff or you know just um you know you could off gas some co2 and whatever but but yeah i mean you're 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 like gear one is just nasal breathing slow you know, and then there's nasal breathing fast, like forced. And then there's forced inhale, relaxed exhale. And then there's mouth, like. These are the stages that are bringing us yeah. higher and higher mm-hmm. up to a greater intensity level. So then the other yeah. direction, you were mentioning things like box breathing, prolonged mm-hmm. exhales, even would you say that increasing the the volume of how much air is being taken in and exhaled is that is that more of a calming effect yeah or is that yeah yes yeah. so like yeah like we're, we're, we're like reducing reducing the volume i mean so big picture here for like the, the my my main like the thing that i love the most is co2 tolerance training mm-hmm. so explain that define that first yeah about it. yeah yeah so co2 we often look at co2 as a waste product. Uh, it's a byproduct of you know, metabolism and, and we want to get it out of the body because it's toxic, but in reality it's, uh, and this is, this is, uh, 
well researched and it, it's most doctors are taught it early, probably early in their in their careers and kind of probably forget about it. But like the Bohr effect, where basically the, the point is that CO2 is essential for in order to release oxygen into working tissues and organs uh, and to be utilized for metabolism, and have energy and that kind of stuff. So CO2 is essential. You know, if we don't have CO2, the CO2 is what causes the urge to breathe. It tells us it gives you that discomfort. Uh, and there's, there's some cool techniques to actually just see that firsthand where you're like, oh shit, it is, it's just CO2. It's not oxygen. I mean, oxygen doesn't cause the urge to breathe. So CO2 becoming more tolerant to CO2 means you can allow to have, you can, you can have more CO2 in the blood without, without having that, that discomfort means that you can process oxygen better and you won't say you're a performance athlete or something like that. Performance athlete means you can last longer by just doing breath work, not training any different. Just right where you're at, we could train you for a couple of weeks, build your tolerance to CO2 and your, your, your uh, capacity will increase. Um, and then if you're looking at someone with anxiety uh, or stress where uh, CO2 tolerance to CO2 is directly correlated to anxiety and panic attacks, um, they've done this test with like literally breathing uh, like high volumes or uh, high percentages of, of CO2. Um, and it, it immediately lists a, a panic attack uh, in those people. So having better tolerance to it allows you to be able to breathe better, which means you aren't hyperventilating because you're not always trying to off gas CO2 because you have a tolerance to it. So when you can breathe slow or lower volume, like we were saying, then we can get into that calm state, but you're not uncomfortable the whole time because you're not, you're tolerant to CO2. So CO2 tolerance training, uh, a lot of it's uh, was de- like like free divers have developed awesome practices for it because you know they want to have tolerance to it. It's like stay underwater longer, but just implementing those practices as a layman or as a as a an athlete are is hugely uh, impactful. Right. Yeah. Overall, I'm hearing that there's uh, there's a way of looking at this as just a performance enhancing thing. Like for example, like Huge. an athlete training their breath is the same as training their leg strength or their speed or their agility. Mm-hmm. And it's something that gets left out. I, I don't think I'm trying to think going back. So I've been an athlete my whole life. The first time that I ever thought about breath or anybody actually told me to think about breathing was when I started lifting weights and it was very rudimentary. It was mm-hmm. like, yeah, exhale on exertion, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's like inhale it. on the way down, exhale on exertion. Yeah, yeah. And it's yep. like, wow, well, what, what pattern is that creating? And that's, that was just mm-hmm. baseline. But yeah. the other time that it got introduced to me was when I started training martial arts. And it seems like martial arts, weightlifting, and, and I think just sports in general, sport has evolved so much in the past 20 years mm-hmm. where they're actually thinking about these things. But yeah. it's funny, you look back at some of the old, um, you know, the, the documentaries on football back in the seventies and eighties, and there's guys like smoking cigarettes on the side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's crazy. Um, uh-huh. That's an interesting one too. Maybe we could touch on that for a moment. But well, first let's talk about the performance thing. Is there anything else to say about that? And then I want to talk about smoking as how this relates. Oh to yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so performance, um, performance for the breath is like, for me, like all, all the, all the CO2 tolerance stuff is where, where I, I, you can just change an athlete. You can change an athlete, whether it's performance, whether it's strength. I mean, if we're looking at actual breath, like during strength, we could talk about that, like, like actually lifting um, the ways you would breathe for that. The way I recommend it is what do you want? So is it, is it, do you want structure? Cause the breath can give you, give that spine structure, you know? So like Valsalva maneuver, you know, that like those kind of, those kind of breath breathing techniques. So if you want structure, like a squat, a deadlift, anytime you don't want your spine flexing or you want to stay structurally sound, you use that breath through a breath hold, uh, to, to stabilize. And that means holding the breath of the movement, which builds that natural blood pressure, which can be intense for some people. Um, but also heart rates pumping, you're getting a little bit of adrenaline. So you do get a little bit, you're, you're the intensity is going up with the lift, but also that nervous system getting that spike. So it can help you maybe lift a little bit more. Uh, that's, that's the idea, probably anecdotal. I don't, I'm not sure about the science totally behind that. Um, All right. on. But, but that's what I've, I've found and what I've, I've read other, other uh, breath coaches that are in the strength world, uh, believe as well. And then using the breath, like those, those exhale and exertion kind of thing with rotation is actually kind of, uh, is kind of interesting as well. And, and 
vocalization, uh, you know, it, in intensity and, and you like, you know, screaming when you like throw something or like you, if you watch any kind of like Highland games or strongman or like any kind of the, the power, like the shot put or something like that. Those, those motherfuckers screamed. <laughs> like, that's, I mean, that's just a forceful exhalation, right? With some, yeah, with some, yeah. with some volume to it, right? Yeah. With some auditory yeah. projection, but it's really just an exhalation. Big exhalation as much as you got. And it's just also like a, a nervous system, uh, just like release, you know, it's like, if you're looking yeah. at like, like with like the nervous system back, going back to it again with, with, with screaming, with, with shaking, with all that, that, that stuff, it's, you know, we're, we're regulating naturally. So let me ask this because on one hand, the a take home message I hear is there's just a lot more to consider about your breath than you probably already are. It's one of those conscious things we can bring to it. And especially when it comes to training or even just breath, I mean, breath work as a, as a parent, <laughs> you know, just yeah. regulating yeah. your nervous, my nervous system while parenting my children through tantrums and food fights mm -hmm. and all of that shit. Uh, so I think it's just another thing that we could, could be thinking about. And if we, if we prioritize our attention towards breath, we might get some value from it as one take home message. Mm -hmm. um, and then also just taking a review, an audit of how much we're impacting our nervous system by what we're doing reactively, by not mm -hmm. even thinking about it. Just uh, maybe the next time the guys who are listening, you go into the gym, are you thinking, how much are you actually thinking about your breath when you're working out mm -hmm. versus is your mind traveling to the hot chick that you saw on the treadmill or what mm -hmm. you got to do later or the music you're listening to. But just the opportunity I think that's available when you yeah. think about breath and incorporating that into how we're doing whatever it is we're doing. Yeah. It's, it's just being, being present, being aware, being grounded, all those, those things, just like we we're talking about early um, with the breath is like, that's the way to get to, to being grounded, being, being aware, being responsive versus reactive, you know, all that kind of stuff. Like that's, that's being, being a man is, is, is being able to, be in your breath and be in your body and be here, you know? So, um, tapping into, tapping into that, the, the breath with, you know, like you said, like going to going, if we're going to the gym and we're, we're, we're training, like who's, we got our earbuds in, we're listening to music. We're, you know, maybe, maybe focused on the movement a little bit. Maybe we're just getting through the movement so we can get out of there. Um, but if we can combine that awareness with the movement, with the breath, uh, you know, just going to get those, those results are going to be uh, popping. Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that I hear in that is that you're either, we're either driving our nervous system because we're being conscious and giving it instruction or we're being driven by it, which is that yeah, more reactive exactly. state. And that, to me, that's mm -hmm. the, that's the thing to look at is in, in all these circumstances in your life, are you driving or is your nervous system driving? Cause mm -hmm. somebody's driving the boat and if it's not you, then, <laughs> then yeah. some, you know, someone is, um, I want to make sure that we touch on this because you mentioned this to me and I, I think this is another place you and I connect a lot is the, okay. the, view, the viewpoint on ancestral and primal health. Mm. So I've heard some of the underpinnings in what you've said already, but really just to give us all an overview of how you see ancestral and primal health. Yeah. So that's a, the probably the, the most impactful uh, piece of nervous system regulation. So if we look at, um, how we are biologically. So let's, let's look at like the hunter gatherer opposed to modern man, the, the, the actual biologically, we, we aren't much different. We actually probably maybe a little bit de-evolved in certain areas, but like, but we are much different biologically. We, we have, there's a lot of, there has been a ton of evolution going on. So we're, we're this kind of the same. And then we look at modern day technological advancements in, in our, our, our social settings and uh, everything else that we are wired into that that's exponential. That's, I mean, we're, we're in huge groups. We're um, we're around this kind of like technology. Uh, we have access to uh, anything we need at any time. And we aren't, we aren't biologically um, uh, geared that way. So the one thing we look at is, the nervous system and like a hunter gatherer is meant to be hyper sensitive and aware because in a natural setting in nature where we are, you know, we're with our tribe, we're about to go out for a hunt with the tribe. You're kind of chilling. Nervous system's chilling. We're just, we're just sitting there and we get up and we have an intention of going towards a hunt. It starts to elevate a little bit. It's, it's knows we, we knows what we're doing, but 
where the hyper awareness comes in is we're walking the, w- the wind changes and it's cooler. We feel that we're like, Oh, it might, it might rain. Um, barometric pressure changes. We can sense these things just naturally. The nervous system is understanding that something could change the, 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 uh, the bushes rustle or like, all right, is that that's either something I have to, I'm going to kill or that's something that's going to kill me. So now we're hyper aware, we're alert, things are starting to change. And that's where the benefit of anxiety comes in, where we have these systems in place to get us focused to either run or to, to fight, you know? And so when we're in, we're in that environment, naturally we, that system, that, that situation's over and we, we head back, we go on our walk, nervous system calms down. We're good. Now we're, in this situation where we're like, we're driving to work, fuck traffic, someone cuts you off. You're like, oh, you, you know, you're screaming at somebody, you're pissed off. And now instead of letting it go, we're just like, pick up our phone, texting where we're driving, like just fucking got cut off by somebody. You know, you tell them you get to work and you tell them bitching about it. And then, so we prolong the situation. Meanwhile, we're, we're in an environment that's like overwhelmingly just like overtaking our hypersensitive nervous system. So we're constantly in that state of like, Jesus, and we'd never have a time to just like calm down because we are socially bred to go, 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 never, never stop, always achieve grind, you know, all this other shit. And the thought of sit down and take a breath while it is on its way up and it is getting more popular. Thank God uh, is, has always been such a lazy or uh, insignificant thing to do. I love that, man. I'm, I'm a man who's constantly trying to figure out how to navigate my, my body and my vision in a world that is so incongruent with what I feel inside myself. You know, the, mm-hmm. the parts of me that, that the, the instincts we have, right? The instincts to rest when my mind is saying, you got to go, 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 go. When you look around at every other mammal in the world and their rest to active cycles are mm-hmm. inverse related to what we do, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. crazy eating cycles everything is almost completely opposite from every other mm-hmm. mammal on the planet yeah. and so just looking at that and, and recognizing hey we've created this maybe i didn't create it directly but i'm certainly participating mm-hmm. in a world that's this way yeah but that's also a choice how yeah. can i choose to live differently and exist differently on my terms in a way that feels good for my nervous system like, this is something mm-hmm. that i'm really in the inquiry of that's why I, I love your your perspectives and think it's so important for men to hear this that mm-hmm. There's so much of the messaging has taken away the permission we have to listen to what our bodies are telling us, override what our bodies are telling us. Yes. I mean, it's, I love a good motivational speech to get me up and going sometimes because Mm -hmm. sometimes I don't have it in me, but Mm -hmm. to, to tell ourselves constantly that we need to be in a certain kind of mode, it it goes against the balance of nature. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, yeah, there is, there's times we got to get up and fucking go and, and kill it you know, literally or figuratively, you know, it's like, that's what it was. It was uh, literal, but, but, but we should be, we should be back to our state where we are not because the more we are in that elevated state, the more we face burnout, fatigue, all that kind of stuff. And then we can't get back to those prime states that we felt like just a beast, just killing it because it's impossible to get back to. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Well, Sounds like a good bookmark and we'll have to pick up the conversation at another point in time. I, I yeah. love that perspective on ancestral primal health and well-being and connecting back mm-hmm. to our instincts. So we'll save it for another day. Uh, yeah, for but sure. before I let you go, I want to hit you with a few lightning round questions and then we can oh, sign God. off here. Are you ready? Okay. That, they're, not, they're, not, they're not too heavy, but let's, <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. go. Don't uh, get out of the mind and into the body for this. Here we go. Let's go. Um, so what is one thing you've learned in your life you wish you knew when you were 18? Mm. Um, I wish, I wish that I knew it was possible to overcome anger and that I wasn't going to be stuck that way. And I had to fear um, ruining relationships or hurting myself. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> that's I, wish so, I, I could that totally mean. relate to that, man. That's like another yeah. 30 minutes of talk we could do right there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what do you think is the most important value to have as a man? So it would be a personal one too. Um, and I guess it goes kind of long, right along with that. Um, and it's just being able to, like I've said a million times, being able to be there and to, to, 
not react. So being able to process, understand, and communicate. Awesome, man. Because that's something that's something I, I was good at before. So that's something I've all I've worked so hard on doing. Still working on it. And what is one thing the world needs more or less of from men right now? Hmm. Hmm. Quite a few on both of those. Let's see. Um, I think that the genuine, that what we need more of is the genuine desire to understand someone else's uh, situation. Because as men, it's common for us to be like, just nah, like shunt, shunt every idea that's not within our own, our own, our own realm and what we've, what we've already preconceived. Yeah. They need to be right. Huh? And exchanging Always. that for empathy and curiosity. I love that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, man. Last but not least, where should people go to find you, follow you, hear more about what you and your partner, Steve, are doing, creating out there. Hit us with it. Um, so my Instagram is the gravity collective. Um, you can check me out on there and all the, all the, the weird, stupid things I do. Plus all the, the, the breath <laughs> stuff and the training kettlebell work and all that stuff. Um, if you're interested in one of our, our ancestral health retreats, uh, origins retreats.com. Um, and that's what we, where we kind of do our, uh, a blend of, like you said, me and Steve, we kind of have our, our blended structure that we do. And usually is like five to seven day trips. Beautiful, man. We'll make yeah. sure we put those up in the, in the show notes awesome. and, and everything to that. Uh, I love your perspective, man. I'm so glad that Instagram hit us with the right algorithm too, so man. we can make this happen. I could tell that we could probably sit down and do this for several more hours and maybe we will. Yeah, someday. man. I love it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'm down. Awesome, man. Well, a lot of respect to you. Love what you guys are doing out there, holding it down in the Southeast and um, look forward to having you on here again, man. All right. Thank you.